Perfect, you got all three of them. Okay, so this block has a mass, and that means gravity is going to be pulling it down. Um, and what happens is, as the block is coming down, that goo is going to push against it. And the other way, when the block is trying to come up, the goo is going to pull it down. So. name of that device is a dash plot. Yeah, we'll just call it friction. Now this is similar to the air resistance that we had. And then finally, it's, I introduce the magnet to have just an external force on the block. So let's talk about each of these. Oh, and just like we did with the airplane problem, is the block goes up and down. we have to decide which of those two directions is positive, and in this class, down is going to be positive. So the magnet tell me that can be both positive and negative? Uh, no, it is uh, all of them can be. So if the spring is stretched, then it's oh, going to be a force up. on the oscillation? It's going to depend on the position of the block. And if the spring is compressed, it's going to be a force down. So these could all change, right? And same thing with the dash box. It's moving down, that force is going to be up. And if the block is moving up, that force is going to be down. Okay. Actually, one of these forces is always positive. It's what's yeah. gravity. And the we've talked about this before. The force of gravity is going to be the mass of the block times some constant. So if we're measuring in meters and newtons and seconds, what's the numeric value of G? 9.8. And if we're measuring in the superior imperial system, we have feet. Two. What is this, 32? Have we talked about this? Yeah. My imperial was better? No. No? Yeah. no. Okay, so pretty much, there's, I think there's three countries in the world that use the imperial system. Uh, but there's one main one. So what's the, pretty much the only country in the whole world that uses the imperial system? The USA. US, yes. USA. And the entire rest <laughs> of the world uses SI. It's the only country to put a man on the moon. USA. <laughs> you got USA. it, exactly. So the superior system, of course. With, with yes. Russian scientists. What's the well, <laughs> We did it. There's an American flag on the moon. We use the imperial system. But yeah, we won the, the, the space. Yeah. Okay, so remember we talked about we have different models of friction. It's proportional to velocity to a power. It's us, it's going to be proportional to velocity. Um, just the first power of the velocity. The magnet is completely under our control, so we'll just describe what's going to be happening with the magnet there. And let me talk about the spring a little bit, a bit more about friction. So let me give you a few more variables that we're going to keep track of. First. We're just going to hang that spring. Can you see it? See it right there again? And the length of that spring, I'm going to call it little L. Then, what I'm going to do is attach my block to the spring. And this distance is the whole thing would be big L. I'll call this 
this distance is L. I might go back and change that. And so this is the block of rest. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move the block. So this is going to be our x equals 0. And then that distance we move from equilibrium is we're going to measure that by x. So if x, so the block is staying here in equilibrium, and if I pull the block down, x represents how far I pull it. So would this be a positive or negative value of x? Positive. If I had a negative value of x, what would that look like? Yeah. That, would, uh, that would be that x is negative. That means it would be up here. So what if x prime was positive? What does x prime measure? That would be the velocity. So if x prime was positive, what would that mean? That's going down. And if x prime is negative, that would be going up. So that's what our x is. Let's look at friction. Why do you say proportional to velocity? I don't remember what letter in your book uses. K for the book I made. So it's either going to be kx or a minus kx. So, it, or no, kx prime. So if it's going down. So if the block is going down, if x prime is positive, what's the direction of the friction? It's pushing up. And if it's going up, if x prime is negative, this is pushing down. So assuming k is a positive number. Oh no, the k is a spring function. So I think it's C. Do you want to use C or gamma? Sorry. I thought we were talking about this thing. No, we're talking about the friction. Sorry. So I think your book uses the letter C. If I can't find it quickly, I'll just. I'm going to call it C for the whole semester. Translate for your book. So when x prime is positive, it's moving down. And when it's moving down, the friction is pushing against it. So the friction, the for friction force is in the negative direction. If it's moving up, if x prime is negative, then this is pulling up and the friction is pulling down in a positive direction. So the force from friction is always going to be the opposite sign as the velocity, which I'm going to represent the friction as negative c times x prime. Is that mu, uh, the constant of friction? Uh, some books. Yeah, so. Some books call it gamma, some books call it c, and I can't remember what your book is. But you're right, mu is another letter that's commonly used for that. Let's talk about a, the springs for a moment. Yeah. Some good numbers here. So springs are represented by. that I've got a spring, and if I apply, if I pull it down and hold it with a force of 8 pounds, it's stretched by 2 feet. So then, what I want you to imagine is if I decide to pull it down with 24 pounds, so now, it's that 24 pounds is going to keep it stretched further. How, uh, what's, how far is it going to be stretched? So if I triple the force, what do you think is going to happen? 
turns it out. And if I want to keep it stretched to 10 feet, so if I want to keep, 10, if I want to keep it stretched to 10 feet, how much force do I need? Yeah. Four yeah. Four yeah. yeah, 40 pounds. Yeah, 40 pounds. So, hook tells us the force needed to keep a spring stretched at X feet is, is well, force is proportional to how far you stretch it. If you stretch it twice as far, the force is going to be twice as much. So Hooke's law says that the force is K times X. And then we just have to decide if that's going to be a positive or negative K times X. So what if the spring is stretched? So that would be a positive x. Which way does the spring force go, up or down? Up. So if x is positive, the spring force is negative. And if I compress this, if I have a negative x, which way is the spring pushing? Down to the positive. So the spring force is always going to be in the opposite direction of the x. If x is positive, the spring force is negative. If x is negative, the spring force is positive. So our spring is minus k. And let's see, all parameters are constant. Just a couple things you should know. This equation that describes how, that describes how springs work is called Hooke's law. And this constant proportionality Called the spring constant. Qualitatively, if k is a big value, we call it a hard spring. If k is a, so, is a small value, we call it a soft spring. So that k really measures how, how hard or how stiff the spring is. So those are the names of all the pieces. It's not moving, there's no friction. Let me ignore the magnet for a moment. And if it's not moving, that means that the spring force and the gravity force are coming at counteract. Or another way to say it is the net force there is zero. So what is the gravity force? M times G. M times G. And what is the spring force? And careful, is the amount that it's stretched here is by L, by negative K times L. And when it's at rest, is we have the net force. Keep that in mind. Keep that very soon. Again, this is going to be a Newton's second law. You know, force is mass times acceleration. Okay, in this one, okay, so in this one, we're thinking of acceleration as the second derivative of our x. So x is efficient. And what forces do we have acting on this? So what forces are acting on our block altogether? I know four of them. So what do we have? Spring, gravity, spring. Okay, and the spring, we have to be a little bit careful, is the spring is stretched by the x distance plus the l distance. So the spring force is going to be minus k, x plus l. Plus, let's see, gravity, what's gravity? Mg. What else do we have? Friction. Friction, so that would be a minus Cx prime. And what 
else do we have? Magnet. Second order linear differential equations. You know what all those words mean? Second order means there's going to be a second derivative, a y double prime. Uh, linear, you know what that means. And we're still doing the ordinary differential equations. So we do the theory. I'm going to use x as the input and y as the output. And when we're doing the actual block on the spring, time is the input and x represents the output of the distance. So right now, theory. I have no idea why it's PQR and G. So second order linear differential equation is one that can be written this way. We're talking about those since day one. And yeah, there's some words. to start with the theory of second order linear differential equations that are homogeneous. And homogeneous just means the g function is known. So we're going to make it even easier. For now, we go back to the block on a spring equation is all three of the coefficients of the output <laughs> variable are actually constant. So we're also going to talk about constant coefficients. So our 
plan. So what it means, constant coefficients, means these functions in front here are always constant. So what we're going to do is first develop a theory to solve second order, linear, homogeneous, constant coefficient equations. And that, oh, what does homogeneous mean for the block on a spring equation? What's zero? zero. What is zero? F is zero. And what did F measure? The magnitude. Yes, the magnitude of the external force. So the homogeneous equations describe it. We have no external force in the system. So the idea is we set the whole thing up. We have a spring with a certain stiffness. The block has a certain mass. The goo has a certain stickiness. As we're going to pull that block down and then start the clock, we're going to watch that block go up and down. And that's what this is measuring. Again, the homogeneous part means that there's no external force, there's no magnet we're applying to it. And the constant coefficients essentially tell us the mass, the viscosity, and the spring constant stay the same. Maybe after we work these out for a while, we develop the theory here. As you can imagine, the spring getting softer as time went on, in which case this would be a non-constant coefficient problem. But for now, or maybe there's dust that's uh, accumulating on the block and it gets heavier. But for now, it's for the block spring system, we assume these are always the same number. So let's do the simplest possible block on a spring. No, just in general. So if I had a block spring system, do I have to put a magnet there or is that optional? Is the dash plot necessary or optional? Right. Is the block necessary or optional? Necessary. And the spring? Necessary. So the simplest possible block on a spring would be x double prime plus x. It's, we've got the block, we've got the spring, and I'm going to switch to Y's looking at this mathematically. But my motivation for studying these is so what I want you to do is think back to your Calc 1 class, and it's fairly early on. We spent some time taking derivatives, and there was some functions you ran into where the derivative, or well, the second derivative, you were back at the original function, except it was the negative of what you started with. Sine trigonometric function. Good. So sine is one function. Are there any others? Cosine. Cosine. Uh, what about? three times the sine of x. Does that satisfy the differential equation? Yeah. And what about six sine of x plus nine sine of x? Ten sine of x? What about sine plus cosine? What's the second derivative of this? Second derivative, negative sine minus cosine. Do you agree with that? So is the second derivative equal to the negative of itself? Yeah. 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 So the, what we call the general solution here Oh, and you've all, I can assume you've all had linear algebra. So the general solution is all the linear combinations of sine x and cosine x. So any function that can be written like this is going to be a solution to this differential equation. And all the solutions to this differential equation are written this way. I can at least use the linear algebra words. It's I can think about this as the description of an operator that takes functions as an input and gives other functions as output. 
and trying to find the solution is when this is equal to zero, is trying to find the null space or the kernel of that operator. That's a subspace, which means it has a basis, and the basis for this differential equations, we call that the fundamental set. So the, base, the two basic building blocks of this differential equation are cosine x and sine x. What's the point? Uh, the basis for the null space of that operator is just the set of building blocks that I need to build the general solution. That's just another way of saying that all the solutions to this differential equation are described as combinations. Four words at this point. Talked about bases. Yes. Are we going to get eigenvalues? Oh, uh, we will actually. Yes. Uh, I can't remember what chapter it is, but we're eventually. Eventually, we're going to have two blocks and three springs. And this, well, this position is going to stretch or compress this spring, which affects the force on that, and vice versa. We get into systems of differential equations, then we're going to do eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So that's down the road a bit. But yes, we will. <laughs> that, that was a terrifying question. Yeah, I know. I was expecting a smile. It's cool. I love that part of linear algebra, so I can't wait to get there. Oh, I, I enjoyed it. I was just trying to think of it like. Yeah, if it's a hard problem, it's doable for people get to. Now it's one block, one spring, no eigenvalues yet. It's the basis. Okay, so we're just going to practice solving second order and linear constant coefficient homogeneous differential equations until I can put any three numbers here and you can tell me what the solution is. So we'll gradually introduce harder and harder ones until we have a complete theory. So think about what type of function could possibly solve this. Is, could I use a polynomial? Something like x to the So it's this, if I used an x to the 10th, this would be a 10th degree polynomial. This would be some sort of 9th degree polynomial. And this would be an 8th degree polynomial. So there would be anything that cancel out this x to the 10th. So this would be an x to the 10th. And if I try to use these guys to cancel it out and get to 0, well, they're not up to it, so I'm not going to be able to kill that x to the 10th. Uh, what about if I had a sign? So some sort of sign function, maybe a times the sign of bx. It's, you see that somehow maybe the y double prime and the y could cancel each other out, but that middle term, the cosine, wouldn't get canceled out. So what do you think would be a function that the function, its derivative and its second derivative, all could somehow interact with each other, possibly cancel each other out. How about E? Is that unreasonable? I was going to say that. Yeah. So let's try, let's at least guess. There's a solution that looks like E to the Rx. So I'm going to imagine I got the e to the rx, the first derivative, the second derivative. Those are all going to have the e's in them. And it's possible, just the right values of r, that they all cancel each other out, and we really end up with this girl. So let's try it. So a derivatives. Is that part okay? And then I'm going to substitute in. So I want y double prime plus plus y prime, just reading over here, minus 6y is 
assuming I've got a solution that looks like e to the rx, which is a reasonable guess, is that means I have to find a value of r that makes this true. And the nice thing is that e to the rx persisted with all the derivatives, so I can factor it out. I'll talk when you're writing is I multiplied two things together and got zero. Have you ever seen e to the rx become zero? No. Neither have I. So that one must be responsible. So what made the zero was the r here. When I factor this, what are the r values? So if the solution looks like this, then we know the R values are negative 3, using the vocabulary we had before. The fundamental set is E to the negative 3x and E to the 2x. Sometimes we'll talk about the general solution. C1 minus 3x plus c2 e to the x. Are these r's that actually get r equals to the zero equilibrium? No, it's the equilibrium is y prime equals zero. This is just homogeneous. Yeah, just equals the alpha state. No. Yeah, so you get equilibrium is when y prime equals zero. But here, it's just this combination of y, y prime, and y double prime equals zero, which for us represents no external force. I'm going to rewrite that equation again. the characteristic equation. So, you got my phone? No, I don't. Oh, my lecture notes. Yeah. I have a pen cap phone and the lecture notes. Uh, somebody keep an eye on the time for me. So, if I'm, give me like a five minute warning. equation with all the adjectives. That's right there. Oh, you right on your desk. It's right there. Cool. This is one you should be able to do. Thank you. So we're going to go to the characteristic equation. functions that make this equation true. What are they? 
Yeah, so remember, it's what we skipped here is the solution looks like y equals b e r x. We calculated y prime, y double prime, plugged it all in, factored the e b r x out, we got this. The r values that work are these two. So what is the final number step? E to the r negative. E to the negative 2x and e to the negative 5x. So the solution looks like this. And the r values, the solution, the r values that solve the characteristic equation tell us which e to the x functions are going to actually solve this. And the general solution is just a description of all the functions that solve this differential equation. solutions here. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's one of them is not going to be obvious. So characteristic equation. second solution is going to be based off this first one, that it's some function times e to the x. And I will spare you the details if that function is just x. And really what happens, this is almost why this is true, is do you believe that any constant times e to the x is also a solution here? And if I think about the product rule, half the time I treat the x function as a constant. So part of that, I'm going to treat it as a constant. The constant times the e to the x, we know, is going to zero out. So let me convince you that this is going to work. So 
y double prime, y prime, and y have two types of terms. So I wanted to keep two different columns for that. And if I add them, sure enough, I get zero. So if I start with this function, be y prime, y double prime, and plug them into the left side of this differential equation, I get zero. What does that tell me? That tells me that x e to the x is also a solution. And that's the second solution that we're worried about. We're trying to find here. Or the general solution is all the linear combinations of this type. But how do you call that? Well, what you do is you assume your solution looks like this. And this is a general trick. So even if it's not constant coefficients, if you find one, the second solution is going to be some function times that. And then I would computed y prime is b prime b to the x plus b to the x. I would have computed y double prime, plugged it in, and then had a differential equation in b that it works on. It's very easy. order linear homogeneous constant coefficient ordinary differential equations. 
until we've exhausted every possible thing that can happen to the three numbers there, and then we'll have a complete theory. The next one we want to look at. Gentle reminder, as you did McLaurin series for these three famous functions, e to the x is 1 plus, remember this? Something like this in your Delta II class, and this is consistent with what you saw. Should 
identity to the zero power is one. And what about I squared? Okay, what's I? What's our I is a number that's uh, raised to the second power gives negative one. Very good. So if I if I if I is the number that when raised to the second power is negative one, and then raise I to the second power, what do I get? Or in other words, if you like to think about i as the square root of negative 1, if I square it, i squared is negative 1. So what about i cubed? Well, i cubed is just i to, or I guess i squared times i, so negative i. And what about i to the fourth? Which I'm going to think of as i squared times i squared. So what's going to happen is i to the fourth is going to be 1 again i to the fifth is i times i to the fourth, which is odd. What do you think i to the sixth is? Negative one, three times over five. Yes? That's good, yeah, I have mixed, I don't know, imaginary numbers belong in three counts. I learned here in the last two semesters before. Deco? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is look at this e to the i x. see some signs and cosines formulas hidden inside here. And then what about i to the fifth? What's i to the fifth? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first collect the parts that don't have any i's in them. Like one minus 1 over 2 factorial times x squared, 1 over 4 factorial x to the fourth. And in green here, I'm going to stop for a moment to change that shot. So in green, I'm going to collect everything with an i in. So it's going to be what we call the real part, so the parts that don't have any imaginary numbers. And the imaginary part, parts that do have imaginary. Anybody else want to give an example? Sure. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, if you grab yours, you pass them. Oh, dude, we'll just pass them back. There you go. And then bring them over to Zoe. Here's So there is all the parts without the i, and then all the rest, the 
three one seven i. Factor that out as x minus one over three factorial x cubed one over five factorial x to the fifth. And these series should look familiar. Is that one minus one over two factorial x squared? That happened to look like any series you've ever seen before. Coincidentally, that's cosine x plus, and I don't know if you've ever seen this series before. May have come up once or twice. What is it? It is sine, yes. So in linear algebra, we had to talk about imaginary numbers, and what you should have gotten out of that is an imaginary number is a rotation and a scale. In linear algebra, or in differential equations, and we have the second version of the talk, and you should know the fundamental relationship about how imaginary exponents work. That e to the i x is cosine x. Pretty much every math class you take after this, is, this is going to show up somehow. Is that why, uh, is that formula why uh, imaginary is the y-axis on the complex coordinates? Is Absolutely that? right. That's actually, it goes a little bit, it's, you're, on, you're on the right track. So what we do, is I can identify, I can go with this, okay, this is interesting. So I can take a complex number. A complex number is a real part plus an imaginary part. And I can think about these as having, talk this over here, I'll try, is there's a real number line here. And what your elementary school teachers didn't tell you is that there's a perpendicular number line in the imaginary. Is 2 plus 3i means go 2 in this direction and 3 in the imaginary direction. So a way to represent this number is it's just moving along two different number lines. So this e to the i x, I'm going to change this to a t. Is the x coordinate is a cosine. The y coordinate is the sine. So what's the shape here? So if x is cosine, y is sine. So think back to your drink class. Uh, do you remember that there's some shape where when I wrote it like this, the x coordinate was cosine and the y coordinate was sine? What was it? It was the inner circle. Very good, yeah. So this e to the i t is really just getting you a point on the unit circle. And then this is where it gets interesting. It is you can imagine that t is time. So what you have is at different times, you've got different points on the unit circle. So as I plug different t values into here, it's uh, going around in a circle like this. And then, if you just took a bright light over here and looked at the shadow of this point going around the circle, it, what would it look like? It would start here, and then it would go up, and then it would go down, and then up again, which is exactly that block on the spring that we're trying to analyze. So the shadow of this thing going around the circle is the block on the spring that we saw originally. Back to yeah. So back to what we were doing. Seven fifteen. Cool. Oh, you want to run out of time? So what we've got? Not two things. Yeah, that's really useful.
sine and the cosine, we can build those up with e to the i x's. Trig identities for complex numbers. And they actually come out really nice. Uh, are you going to see this before? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, this is cool. So, uh, so much to do here. So if I had e to the i times x plus y, you see that's cosine x uh, of cosine x plus y plus i times sine x plus y. And if I change this to e to the i x times e to the i y, this would be cosine x plus i sine x times cosine y plus i sine y. And if you multiply these out, end up with the identity for cosine of x plus y and the identity for sine of x plus y. So it's really this is the best way to develop the trigonometry. You have the unit circle built into it, and then you have more stuff going on here. What we see is we had two fundamental sets. And the fundamental sets were well, one way to look at it was these two. And another way to look at it was cosine x and sine x. So the fundamental set are the two basic functions that are the building blocks for all the solutions to the differential equation. And what this says is I can build the solution out of sines and cosines. I can build the solution out of these two functions. But we see that anything that I can build with these two, I can build with sine and cosine. And anything that I can build with sine and cosine, I can ultimately build with these two. These are both. This is what falls out when we just use that idea of going to the characteristic equation, solving it, and using the R values. But not everybody likes imaginary numbers as much as we do. So traditionally, instead of going with the imaginary solution, we work with the real version. Use our method and then we transform to the real number and then solve the 
Exactly. We're going to talk more about that. But yeah, so that's what, so what's going to happen is you're going to have a differential equation. You're going to get the characteristic equation. Sometimes you're going to have imaginary solutions to the characteristic equation, which means it appears your solutions are going to look like that. And then we're going to practice this on Thursday. If we want to convert those imaginary solutions into real solutions, assign the cosines. Five minutes. Which is what you expect. If you have a block on a spring, what are you going to see it do? You can see it bounce up and down like that, which is where the sine and cosine. Okay. Oh yeah. Let's talk about these in general. So here is the general version of the type of problem we're trying to solve now. Set ordinary, second order, linear, homogeneous, constant coefficients. And the general strategy is AR squared plus BR plus C is zero. I was kind enough to give you back verbal ones, but in general, the quadratic formula solve any of these. In your algebra class, you learn that's how you get the solution. Okay, and then it's how did the imaginary numbers come up? Is what about the quadratic formula that told you you're going to end up with imaginary numbers? Right? So if this number is negative, the formula forces me to take the square root of a negative number, in which case I've got imaginaries. Uh, other options are maybe this is zero. In that case, I'm doing negative b plus zero and negative b minus zero. So that's where that I have to choose the same value of r twice. And you know what you do there, right? You have to bump it up by x. Or the third option is maybe this b squared minus 4ac is positive, in which case I have two different real numbers, and those are the first ones we did. So once we talk about how to turn the imaginary numbers into sines and cosines, you'll have a complete theory on how to solve these. It's you'll go to here, you'll find the values of r. If you have two positive values of r, which can happen if the number inside the square root is positive, you know what to do. If this happens to be zero, there's only one value of r, you know what to do. If this is negative, you're taking the square root of a negative, you're in this case, we'll finish that up on Thursday, and you know what to do. Oh. Fun class. Thank you.